This is Alexandra, and with Thierry, who's here but will soon disappear, uh, we'll be teaching the biophysics, well, the two first weeks of the biophysics lecture, and we'll see exactly what we cover, right? So just think in your mind statistical biophysics. Uh, we're going to go from evolution through inference to neuroscience. So anything that's alive, okay? Uh, and the way we're going to, so that's feedback, of course. Okay. The way we're going to do it is with the still feedback. It's not feedback, I think. Just no, I think uh, try to put it a little bit. Yeah. powerful. Yeah, okay. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to try and make your life for the exam extremely easy by giving you homework. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the homework is going to be easy, really easy, but the only point of it is that you go through your lecture notes and you know you try to write down the same thing once again, so that then then you go to the exam and we're really not going to be mean or evil. We're just going to try and see whether anything stuck. And as I said, there'll be two homework sets, and you can you should do them together in as big groups as you know, you find the optimal cluster size. Uh, this is, as Andrea said, completely collective, completely non-competitive. We just want something to, for you to re retain something, okay? Uh, now I have to try not to kill myself on this stage. And chalk, yes, this chalk, okay. Uh, so yeah, so, so I think that's everything for practical information. Uh, Let's start, if I've forgotten something, uh, it'll come up. So, uh, and yeah, as, and uh, again, as Mattel and Andrea said, you have a very diverse background, and I'm going to assume, uh, you know, that you, uh, some things may be repetitive from your physics classes, some things may be repetitive from your high school biology, or whenever is the last time you were taught about biology, I am going to assume that you're somebody born in the last 20, 30 years and you did see some biology in school in your life, okay? So if you have no idea what the hell a cell is, look it up on Wikipedia, <laughs> okay? Um, sorry, so this is not... So we're going to start with a simple puzzle just to show you that, you know, uh, Life is, is a vast concept. So uh, it starts off with the statement that the US counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is highest are mostly rural, rural, sparsely populated, and located in the traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Okay? So if you know anything about world politics, this makes sense to you. Because if you think about these states in the uh, U.S., you think about bad food and you think about, you know, basically poor people and things like that. So that makes sense. They're not very healthy. They get sick. But there's a similar statement, which is also true, is that the U.S. county in which the incidence of kidney cancer is lowest are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Okay? So this, these are exactly the two same sentences with the only word changed being highest and lowest. And both of these statements are true. So what's going on? Any ideas? It's a physics question. I, I could replace kidney cancer with uh, possession of beetles. Okay? So what's the key word in these sentences? Maybe the definition of incidence, absolute or relative. Good, good idea, good idea, but no. There's causality no. between counties. 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 Yes. Okay. So you're getting the idea that cancer and rural and, and where they're located are not the important words. The only important word is sparsely populated. Okay? Is that there's 
basically what this is a statement about is small numbers and that small numbers gives you noise. Okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about today in, in different settings. So this is just to sort of show you that you know, it, it, the, the idea that small numbers gives you noise is present really everywhere, even in things that uh, look abstract. And so in bio, you know, oh, I'm sorry, this is really bothering me. This is going to sort of defeat the purpose of having the mic, but um, so there's other, uh, so in many biological systems, this is an issue because in many biological systems, we have to deal with small numbers of noise. And this is just an illustration of a reaction. So, okay, so in the cells, we have many elements. We have DNA, which is what gives you genes. We have proteins. Uh, we have enzymes, and these things come together and interact usually through chemical reactions. And if you have a lot of reactions, if you have a lot of elements, then there's a lot of reactions taking place at a given time. So this is the mean number of reactions per time, and this is the cumulative number of reactions. So you see that the cumulative number of reactions grows steadily. So if the, say, purpose of this reaction is to produce something like a protein, uh, then you would have a steady increase, a smooth increase in proteins, okay? Because you have here in this example about 40 reactions per time where a reaction is when two balls hit each other. However, if you have small numbers, uh, you don't have many reactions per time. You have either zero or one, and then the cumulative goes up in steps, okay? And this is essentially the limit that cells find themselves in that we have small numbers of everything. And so, okay, so what is everything in a cell? Uh, what we're going, well, there's a lot of things and different people will tell you about different things, but uh, just to give you some sort of one concrete example for the rest of what we'll be talking about today, uh, we're going to be talking about genes and proteins. So genes, so which are just bits of DNA, which we will often draw just like this. There's some sort of gene here. And this gene, when it gets expressed, it produces a protein. Okay? So that's the, the this is gene or DNA. This is a sort of schematic way of picturing it. But the way, so you also know that probably you've heard this before, that in all the cells in your body, you have the same DNA, right? Everybody's heard that? Yeah. However, you have different cells, right? You have a nervous cell, or you have an epithelial cell, which is a part of your, uh, of, of your skin, and you have a muscle cell, and you have a kidney cell, and blah, 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 blah. So how come they're different? So they're different because they express different proteins. Proteins are the workers of a cell. They actually are the ones that make things happen. And the way they express it is that this information encoded in the long-term think uh, in, in, in the long-term information storage of the cell, which is the DNA, which gets extracted through, you transcribe this, uh, this thing, the DNA, which means you make mRNA, so this is cheating, first you make mRNA, and then from mRNA, you translate the mRNA, and you make proteins, okay? But how does it happen that not, if this is just continuously happening, which it is, how do we get different cells? That's because different proteins are expressed in different cells, and that's because this process is regulated. So this upstream of the gene, there's a site which is called a promoter, and some proteins, which are called transcription factors, bind to it and this tell this gene you're going to be expressed or you're not going to be expressed. So that's the, that's the simple story. And then the story gets very, uh, very, can get very complicated, but basically the bottom line is that there's some sort of regulation. So let me give you a concrete example of regulation before we go into sort of dealing with small noise and everything else in this. And this is a classic example which is called the lag operon. So people often say this is the hydrogen atom of biology, but oh, I, you know, 
whether you want to think of it that way or not. And I'm guessing Matt Scott will actually bore you to death with the lag operon in week three and four. But who's heard of the lag operon? Okay. Okay. So that's a small number. Um, so the basic thing is this is something that bacteria have. Okay, but people like to study bacteria, physicists like to study bacteria because you can do things to them and get quantitative numbers. Okay, they're easy to deal with labs and a lot of things that are true for us are true for bacteria. So bacteria like us like to eat and bacteria's favorite food source is called glucose and actually it's your favorite food source too, right? It's what makes you know, your, your sweet, sweet, and all that. It's the basic sugar. And it's the sugar that's most, that it, you know, when you take it in and you're happy. You don't need to do any work. And bacteria are the same. They take glucose in and it's instant happiness. Okay? But just like us, bacteria don't always get what they want. And there's different sugars out there. All of them way more complicated than then glucose, one of them is called lactose, there's other ones. But the problem with these other sugars is that they have to, when bacteria takes it in, to be happy, to use it, to get energy out of it, it first needs to break it down into glucose, okay? It needs to break it down. So if you remember anything from high school chemistry, you know, you... I actually couldn't draw either glucose or lactose at this moment. Uh, this is more complicated. So there's a bacteria swimming around, and as long as it has glucose, it's going to eat it. Uh, but if it doesn't, it has to do. If it doesn't find glucose, it's you know it's not going to die. It's going to eat lactose. So the lac operon is basically a, comp a set of genes that it turns on when it figures out that I don't have any glucose in the environment, but I only have lactose. So this is the, the set of rules that a bacteria will express these genes only when glucose is low and lactose is high. Only in one of, in this condition. In all the other conditions, even when glucose is low but there's no lactose, it will still not express it. Okay, so it has this switch, it has this machine. And what, so what these genes do, that they have names, and what they do is they first bring in lactose from the outside, they, one of them pumps it in, and the other one actually breaks it up. And there's a third one that does something yet more complicated, okay? So there's these genes that actually make the bacteria be able to eat it, um, but they'll only be produced when lactose is there, because otherwise it's useless, right? It's a waste of these proteins and it takes energy to produce them. So it's a switch. So how does this switch work? So this switch works in two ways. First of all, when lactose is there, is, is, sorry, before, let's, let's forget about lactose. Normally, this set of genes is repressed. There's a protein called the lag repressor, which is coded in a gene which is upstream of this, which physically the repressor binds to the site, to, a, to the beginning of this set of genes. The set of genes is called an operon, and it physically represses it, okay? And then this, gene, this set of genes cannot be expressed. <laughs> what it actually hap so the way genes are expressed is using something called RNA polymerase, which is a machine that reads out DNA, and what it does is it binds in the place of the polymerase, and then this polymerase cannot bind. It physically occludes. Okay, so this is the repressor. So the repressor represses this set of genes. Uh, however, when lactose is present in the environment, if you find lactose, the lactose represses the repressor. Okay, so minus times minus gives us a plus. Repressing of a repressor unrepresses the operon, and now these genes can be transcribed. However, that's not the full story. That's not enough. They can be, but they won't be until they get an additional signal saying, go for it. And that's called an activator. It's called CRP, which is a molecule that will only bite and activate the, this set of genes if it sees a molecule called, say, CAMP, doesn't matter, but this molecule is only produced uh, when there's no glucose. So when there's glucose, it represses producing this molecule, okay? So then this is repressed, so there's no plus sign, okay? So this is like a 
This is the plus information, this is the minus. So only if there is lactose to unrepress it and there is no glucose to activate it, will you get expression. And it's all encoded in these molecular binding reactions. Okay? And so now what's interesting about this system is that these, for example, the lag repressor and all of these molecules are there in very small numbers. So these, these molecules that tell genes to do something, to, to be expressed or to be repressed, are called transcription factors because they transcribe and they're a factor. They're just proteins. They tell them to do something. And they're usually in the cell in about one to ten molecules, okay? So really small numbers. Uh, the, what happens here is I said mRNA gets produced. This is again a few copies of mRNA per cell. And then you have one, two, a few copies of DNA. You can have a few copies of DNA in bacteria because when a bacteria divides, it can actually, a bacterial chromosome is circular. If your gene of interest is here, if it starts dividing, you can, the rest of the chromosome can be dividing. You know, it's making two loops. You'll have two copies of a gene. And before it finishes, uh, it can start to divide any, uh, again. But generally, you can think of the order of one. So the numbers are small. Okay. Uh, what, okay, what, what is IPTG? IPTG is just a synthetic version of lactose. It's just a molecule that's used in a lab that has the same uh, form as lactose. So I, I, this is sort of a historical aside. The lactose has been, uh, was discovered in the 1960s in Paris uh, by Jacob and Monod and Revolv and others. And they figured this out just by looking at how bacteria grow on different sugar sources, right? So it's like the experiment you will go through here with you as the bacteria for the next four weeks of the cafeteria will give you different food sources and very quickly you will figure out which, what you like and what you don't like. And so that's what they did. They just saw how quickly they grow and they were able to figure out by the logic of it it's really, you know, sort of the power of the mind in use. It's a very beautiful experiment. So, but now, well, even now, people are still studying this to understand it, not just as the story that I told you, but actually using numbers. And um, I'm not very good with this thing. Uh, so you, you have many more tools. You can put proteins that fluoresce into cells and then you see signals and you can actually measure how much signal comes from one protein. There's ways of doing that. And so I'd just like to tell you sort of a, a, a quick story that hopefully will inspire you uh, to think about the things like cells quantitatively. Uh, and this is a story from Terry Haas lab in, uh, in San Diego where basically uh, he said, well, if, every, if this is really the hydrogen atom of biology, uh, and I'm a physicist, so I know that for hydrogen atoms we can correct, rel calculate relativistic corrections and all things like that, you know. I know the numbers have to add up. Well, then they should also add up in biology. So I'm going to put in, um, I'm going to put in, different concentrations of this, la of this synthetic lactose and different concentrations of the CAMP, which is this thing that induces it. And at different concentrations, I could, should see different levels of expression of this gene. And so he went in and he measured it. Well, actually, a student, Tom Coleman, who started off as a string theorist, went in and measured it. Uh, and uh, then they did the theoretical calculation and they figured out the same thing. And when they compared the two things, how much it should grow, they saw that in the theory they should have had a hundredfold increase here. And in the experiment they only had a threefold. And here they should have had a thousandfold and they only had a tenfold. So basically it didn't add up. Okay? 
So he said, okay, so this system that's been studied since the 1960s and every biologist in the world tells me it's boring and we understand everything about it, we actually don't understand anything about it because the numbers don't add up. And then he went, well, poor Tom went in and built many, many mutants, changed, fit, fiddled with many things in these cells and finally got the agreement with it, with, between theory and experiment. And he understood, in fact, that this synthetic IPTG molecule is not the same thing as lactose because it's pumped into the cell at a different rate. He understood that looping of DNA is another important feature that actually represses things much more than just having the repressor. And he figured out a few other things like that. But the bottom line is that if you set your mind to it, biology follows the same, or the living world follows the same world as a semiconductor, as a hydrogen atom, as anything else. And if you really want to say you understand the system, the numbers have to add up, okay? So with that, Let's do the numbers. So, um, maybe, no, maybe before we do the numbers, one more experiment. So I said small numbers, and I sort of motivated you where the small numbers come from. Uh, but do they actually matter in cells? So this is an experiment that comes from Mike Elowitz's lab. Uh, well, from Mike Elowitz from a long time ago, so this is now 2002, a very long time ago, I guess you were all in primary school or something, uh, but uh, m what Michael said is that, okay, if there is really this noise, and all these physicists are getting excited about noise, he was also a physicist, then we should see it in cells. And he did a very simple experiment in E. coli where he took two colors, he so let me put this up. Uh, this is what an E. coli chromosome looks like. This is the DNA in E. coli. It's circular, okay? And he put two fluorescent probes. So he basically puts in a protein. He co puts in the DNA that codes for a protein that when it's expressed, this protein, one will light up in red and the other one will light up in green, okay? And he puts them equidistant from the origin of repli replication, which is where the E. coli starts to divide. And he puts them under exactly the same control. Everything's the same. So he basically builds in, in, on one DNA. He builds a system that is as controlled as possible. And that the two colors should be doing exactly the same thing. And he says, well, if they are going to do exactly the same thing as a function of time, if I mix red and green, we learn when we're about three years old that when you mix red and green, you get yellow, right? And, but if they're not doing exactly the same thing as a function of time, then I'm going to get an ensemble of colors, right? I'm going to get a set of different colors because I'm going to have some sets that have more red and some cells that have more green and everything in between. So I'll get a rainbow. This is what he got in the experiment. <coughs> okay? He gets exactly this thing. So although this is as controlled a situation as he can hope for, what you see in the cell is that each of these two promoters does two different things. Okay? In exactly the same soup. So eliminating any environmental uh, for any environmental contributions. So then he can actually quantify the noise, and he did that. He wrote down some Langevin equations, uh, but the basic idea is that if there's some external signal that they're both responding to, the, the red one responds with some noise eta1 and the blue, uh, green one with eta2, then if he plots the red versus the green, Everything that is common, the noise that is common to them, will make the, their expression change in the same way, right? If there's some signal from the outside saying, oh, you should express more, if it's really upstream, it'll make both X and Y express more, right? And if it's less, then less. But if it's something that's specific to the red or the green, then it'll change in this direction, 
Right? Everybody agrees? Yeah? They can be differences from the, due to the fact that they might be of different density. Yeah, so that's exactly why they put it this way. They put it at exactly the same positions. Yeah, but the, okay, they are exactly the same distance from the yeah. application, but they can be of different lengths. So they're not the same genes. They are. They're exact. The you know, they're very similar genes. Okay. The you know the the. I, I, okay, I'm not an experimentalist. I can't exactly tell you what's the difference between the GFP and uh, RFP that they used because it actually they, it wasn't uh, red and green. But uh, but the, the, there is very there's not a lot of noise from that. You can also ask. Okay, it actually takes some time for these proteins to fold and fluoresce. You could say there's some difference, but it's not that. And we'll see in a second line. But it's a good good idea. Yeah. Okay. So what? So bacteria have circular DNA. We don't, right? We have DNA that is elongated and then folds in a way. Genes are expressed on the surface. Yeah. So there's it's still double stranded DNA, just with the the helix and everything, and then. Uh, they're just expressed. The DNA opens up in a play in a certain place, and then they're expressed. Okay. So, but because basically in lab conditions, E. coli replicates all the time. So they wanted to eliminate problems with that. When it replicates, then you start having instead of having the two strands, you have four strands at a given time. So they wanted to deal with maybe having too many copies. So they wanted to say, if I'm going to have four strands of the red one, at the same time, I'll probably have uh, four strands of the, the green one. So that's why they wanted them equidistant. So that's the basic idea. OK, I'll also add, this is not precision science. This is not a quantum optics experiment, right? So uh, you know, roughly is the key word here. Uh, so, but you know, basically that's why they will still get noise in both directions. But the question is, how much noise in which direction? Okay. So they saw noise in this direction too. So that could be any external factors. But they also saw a lot of, a lot of noise here. So they call this extrinsic noise because it comes from the outside, and this intrinsic noise. And they saw quite a lot of it. Okay. So where does this intrinsic noise come from? Uh, and this is really to answer your question. Uh, so what they looked at then is noise as a function of the rate of transcription. So they built different strains, which ex so different types of bacteria, different colonies, where they expressed more or less, um, where they expressed more or less. Uh, well, basically, they expressed more or less of these red and these green proteins. And while the total noise and the extrinsic noise followed some pattern, intrinsic noise, so this component, went as 1 over n. OK? Uh, and the other thing they did, so this is the wild type, but they also used this lag operon thing uh, to take a protein and put in IPTG. So that means they unrepressed the repressor. So they put the, these two uh, colors under the control of this lag repressor, which typically represses things in the lag operon. And they unrepressed it. And then they got something, that, a gene that produced loads and loads of proteins. OK? That, that, that was the point of that. And when they produced loads and loads of proteins, everything went yellow. So this shows that this, these two facts, the facts that when you suddenly produce a lot of proteins, and that if you produce a lot of proteins, the intrinsic noise goes to 0, and it falls off as 1 over n, suggested that it comes from small numbers. This is just them fooling around with other things. Okay? So let's see where this expectation comes from, that it should go as 1 over n. So if we were to write down uh, so let me do a simplified version of this, and let me just forget. So we have our gene, and 
we're producing proteins. Let's forget about mRNA. We produce proteins with a rate R, and let's forget about regulation for now. Let's do the simplest thing. And proteins can be degraded with a rate of 1 over tau. So there's a degradation time scale, uh, which is tau. And now I want, what I want to do is I want to write down an equation for the probability of having G proteins. So I'm going to call my proteins G uh, at time t. Okay? So I'll, what I want to do is I want to write down the master equation. Everybody knows what the master equation is? Okay, most now, now we have most heads nodding, so I'll assume that if you don't figure it out, it's just a bookkeeping equation for what goes in and what goes out for the probability, okay? So this is the probability of having G proteins at a given time. So how can I make proteins? Right, I make them at the rate G if I, assuming that I have G minus one proteins. Uh, and okay, and the other way I can make protein ha, get into the G state if I have G, sorry, if I have G plus one, but I make one die. Okay, and since it's a bookkeeping equation, I also have to figure out how I can get out of these states. So is this okay with everybody? Right? This is a balance equation. This, these are terms of how I get into the G state, and these are state the, my bookkeeping for how I get out. Yeah? Sort of? Okay. Sorry, what is the... R is production. R is the, pro sorry, maybe I should put R here. R is the production rate. This is the degradation time scale. I, oh, I'm, this is above death process with a constant production rate. Everybody happy? If I'm going to, look, the way the thing, I want to have G proteins. I can get into having G proteins because I had G minus 1 and I produced them at the rate R. I, uh, or I had G plus 1 and I killed 1 with uh, rate 1 over tau. But I also can lose uh, having G proteins by killing one and then I go to G minus one or by producing one and I go to G plus one, okay? All I'm doing this is I'm writing this in terms of equations. And now I'm gonna solve it and to solve it, I'm gonna introduce raising and lowering operators. So I'm gonna introduce a lowering operator which takes the probability distribution and decreases the state by one. And I'm going to introduce a raising operator, which takes a state with G proteins and turns it into a state with G plus one. Okay? Or does applying this to any function, that's what it does. This is like in quantum mechanics, okay? Think about these as um, A and A dagger. Okay, and they, you can write down similar commutation relations for these and you can play the same gaze. The commutation relation is some slightly different than in quantum mechanics, but there's a whole formalism. If you're interested, you can go and play with it, okay? But we're not gonna, we, we, we're not gonna do this here. We're gonna do the baby version. Okay, so we're gonna look at the steady state solution And I'm going to just rewrite exactly the same equation using my operators.
um, and not screw up. Okay, so so far I haven't done anything. I've just replaced every time I have a G minus one by this, and whenever I have an E plus one, uh, a, P, a G plus one by that. But now I'm going to notice that in fact this term uh, I can rewrite as this. Okay, because if I first lower and then increase, I'm going to get a one. So I rewrite this one as a combination of lowering and increasing. And now I have these two things. And this is my equation. And if I wanted to solve it in steady state, I just need to make sure that what's in this parentheses is zero. So in other words, and so this gives me a recursion relation, uh, which I can solve easily. Okay, specifically for example, r tau p naught is p1. Okay, so you can work backwards and solve this equation to get this. And, uh, and then I need to normalize. So it's a probability distribution. So I normalize by summing over the number of proteins over G. Um, I've got, so this needs to be equal to 1. Uh, I sum over G. Uh, so this is P0 times this thing, which is, sorry, which is an exponential. I'm jumping ahead. And so this needs to be equal 1. So P0 is e to the minus alpha. Okay. And so at the end of this, let me write it here. Maybe I get that PG is R tau G, G bank E to the minus R tau. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this is the answer. Uh, and you should be getting a warm and fuzzy feeling now. What is this? What's this distribution called? Poisson. Yeah, it's a Poisson distribution. And why do we love the Poisson distribution? What's so special about it? What's the like, you know, what's the one thing that's super simple about the Poisson distribution? Yes. The mean is equal to the variance. Very good. Okay. So the reason we went through this and the reason it's so important for all of this small noise stuff uh, is because this is a very, very powerful signature. So as you were pointing out, by, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of differences that you can't control for. But if you do an experiment and you get your variance equal to the mean, that's something that's very easy to check, right? You're going to do an experiment, so it's going to be noisy. But, you know, one is still a very concrete thing to aim for. Um, so, and what this tells you is we just did an example where nothing interesting happens, okay? This is basic or sometimes called constitutive 
gene regulation. This is the boring stuff. No, actually it's called, well, maybe gene expression because there is no regulation, okay? There's nothing interesting happening here. So if you do, your, you do an experiment and you get the variance equal to mean, you know this is a not regulated gene. Uh, if you get something else, that means there's something interesting happening. There's some sort of regulation. So maybe one other sort of thing to take home from this is that we solve this equation uh, this way. You can solve it in many different ways. You'll solve it in another way in homework. I'll tell you in a second how. But the thing to remember is this is a one-dimensional linear equation, right? Even if I add bed and whistles, a master equation is a linear equation. A one-dimensional equation in steady state, you can always solve by recursion. By hook or by crook, you can solve it. So even if it looks complicated, I need to erase. Yeah? Uh, in the first equation, uh, I, I wonder if something is similar to rho is g. Uh, yeah? Yeah, g, yeah. Oh, g. I, I think because these two are different. No, 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 this is, I, I apologize for my handwriting, which will get worse. Okay, I wasn't planning on making a break, but I, should I make a break, a five-minute break? Yes? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let me tell one thing and we make a break I, because this is something just that you're going to do for homework, right? So a master equation in generally, I can write, you know, this, it's some, as I said, linear operator acting on some probability distribution. Another way to solve it is using a generating function. So who's seen generating functions before? Okay, most of you have. But now this is the thing, that some of you are earlier in your curriculum than others. So you're gonna do a homework problem with, uh, okay, so this is the definition of a generating function. Um, it's like going to Fourier space. Okay, it's just like taking the problem to Fourier space. This is a complex variable. And so you're doing a serious expansion. And what we're gonna ask you to do in homework, in the homework is rewrite a slightly more complicated version of that in generating function space and solve it. And the reason generating functions are useful because if you do solve it, then you can easily recover the probability distribution by now expanding your, sorry, uh, Z, G, I, I have different notations in my notes. I have to be careful now. Uh, in expanding your solution, which you'll find more easily uh, as, a, as a series, and it's the derivative with respect to Z. Z. Now, the generating function, you go into Z space. You forget about G. The idea is you get rid of G, and it so happens that in many cases, it's just technically easier to solve in this space. It's, it's, it's like going in Fourier space, right? Sometimes it's easier to solve something in Fourier space, and probably not, maybe this afternoon we'll do an example of something that's more easier to solve in Fourier space, and then, then we can go back, okay? But if you, this is the way to go back, so this is like the reverse Fourier transform. But the main thing about it, and this is why it's called the generating function, is that you can calculate the moments of this distribution. So moments are the mean, variance, and other things that we never talk about. Uh, formally, there's a z to dl, but it really doesn't matter. So if you want to calculate the z, Elf moments, you do this, okay? And there's a normalization that 
the generating function taken at one corresponds to just plugging in a one here, so that gives you normalization. Okay? And g of z equals zero is p of g equals zero. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is just, in case you've never seen it before, it's useful and it's cute. Uh, and a break, so five, ten minutes, what's the norm? Five minutes is okay? Okay, five minutes, which will bleed probably, so. Uh, so, and uh, before we uh, leave, uh, so can you read the blackboard? No, I think it's possible not to write in the very last Okay, okay. so in the break, uh, why don't you take your chair and put it uh, here? <laughs> So now that we do the break, uh, how far do I go? When do I stop? I stop at 1.45? Uh, I mean, what? Two hours long. So oh, I have a two. Okay, okay. I thought, okay, I thought I had a... Okay, so just before I erase this, if you're interested in the in this uh, lowering raising formalism, okay, I have a review. I don't remember exactly from. It's on my web page. It's also on the archive from 2011 of 2012. It's me, Andrew Muggle, and Chris Wiggins. Uh, it's called Analytical Methods for Something. And uh, then there's a re more recent review. I think uh, it's also on the archive. This is not going to stick. Uh, by Irvin Fry and the collaborator, uh, which goes into way more technical detail. So, the formalism is due to Doi and Peliti. Okay, I, I keep on talking so that you regulate. Okay. Uh, so, question from the break, tell us more about the biology, because we're lost. So, okay, this is called the central dogma of, bi of molecular biology, that from DNA you make mRNA, you make proteins. Okay, so long-term genetic information is encoded in the DNA, gets transcribed into short-term uh, information of mRNA. mRNA is short-lived. DNA is there forever, as long as you're alive. And you pass DNA on to your children. And it's the same thing for bacteria. Uh, and uh, then proteins are what the workers, right? Anything that happens is mostly proteins. Um, so every, every step is regulated. Now, physically, the way regulation works, is that you have the DNA there, and as I said, there's a machine, it's called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase comes and it binds uh, to a site which is called the promoter, okay? This is just a big machine, also a protein, and it transcribes the gene, which actually means DNA is made out of nucleic acids, okay? It's made out of these letters, A, G, T, right? When we sequence things, we make lists of letters. What this does is it takes it and translates it into essentially the same letter with one difference, okay? And, but it always, so it faithfully translates it, and that's what mRNA is. mRNA is an exact copy of one of the DNA strands. And then the mRNA has the information, and another machine called the ribosome comes and takes this information, which is encoded as nucleic acids, and makes it into what's called amino acids, which are the building logs of proteins. So a ribosome is something that takes a letter, which is a letter sequence, something like A, T. So these are the letters we have. They stand for different nucleic acids, but you can imagine. So you have a sort of word like this. A ribosome comes and says, I know. Then they're read out in groups of three. And it will take this and translate it into an amino acid, a specific one, and this into another one. And if you want to know which one, it's on Wikipedia. 
I don't remember. I'm not a chemist or a biologist, okay? But so this is what a ribosome does. This is mRNA. And you have the same thing. Well, okay. Uh, now for the ones that actually know something, I shouldn't cheat. So in mRNA, this will, a T gets translated into a U. That's the only difference. For all practical purposes, it's the same molecule. It's just slightly different, okay? So this is faithful. This is RNA polymerase. And this is faithful. And this is now, it requires reading. So what it does is when it sees this, a ribosome knows, goes out and finds the right amino acid if that's floating around in the cell and puts it together. And then a set of amino acids is what we call a protein. Okay? And regulation. So another protein, a transcription factor, can come and physically bind. Uh, so this is an, an, a picture for an, indu uh, an, an activator. So there's two modes. There's repression and activation. Okay, this is plus, this is minus. A repressor will bind physically here where the promoter binds and it'll make it impossible for the RNA polymerase to bind, okay? It's just physical exclusion typically. So if it does that, then it's, it's, it can't bind. And so then you don't, the protein doesn't get made, the mRNA doesn't get made. An activator will come and it'll bind somewhere close on a side that's called an operator. And it'll basically change the free energy of this thing, that, uh, of this DNA protein um, thing. I don't know, complex, complex is the word I'm looking for, and make it easier for the uh, polymerase to bind, okay? It'll probably induce some conformational change in practice. But we won't go into that. That, that gets soft mattery and you can calculate it. You can do a lot of polymer physics here. We won't go into it, okay? Is that just a basic, a better idea of what, how this regulation happens? And then an inducer is that like, so that was la, uh, CAMP in the molecule. It's something that binds to an activator, physically changes the conformational state of the activator, making it possible for this activator, the, then the activator becomes more willing again. It decreases the free energy of binding and the activator is more likely to bind. Okay? Okay, so. Let me, uh, so just to motivate again what you'll be calculating in, in the homework again, actually what happens is, as I said, uh, you get this, the DNA gets transcribed into mRNA and then it gets transcribed into proteins. So when we did our master equation, we ignored the mRNA step and we just went DNA to proteins. And in reality, what happens is that you have this one mRNA, and this mRNA can produce many proteins. So it'll be transcribed many times, okay? And each time it produces one protein, but it'll hang around for, a few, you know, depending on the species from half an hour to even a few hours. And during that time, it can be transcribed a few times. So if we want to build a model like this, where we don't want to deal with the mRNA, because it doesn't really do anything, well, in some cases it gets regulated, but we won't talk about that. In many cases it doesn't, it's just an intermediate step. So we can say that instead of going from one RNA, uh, DNA to one protein, you go to B proteins, okay? Which is called a burst of proteins. And this is actually what you see in experiments. Uh, these are experiments from Sunny Shi's lab where they build this very smart microfluidic device. Microfluidics is like miniature plumbing. Uh, 
you, you know, you can build little rods. So they, they use this flore again, fluorescent markers. Okay, why do people use fluorescent markers? Because fluorescent things make cells light up and they're easy to see. You stick it under the microscope and even a theorist will see it's there, okay? It's easy. So they like things that fluoresce. So they had this molecule in these cells that fluoresces, but the problem was that it would get pumped out of the cell very efficiently because it wasn't a good molecule for the cell. Cells are smart things. They can get rid of things they don't like. And so they, what they did here is they uh, built this microfluidic device where they trapped the cells in these mini chambers so that the cells were pumping out this molecule, but that you could still see it because it was in a fake cell around it, okay? Made uh, in, in this fake chamber. And then they saw how the fluorescence went up. And when they looked, so this is the time, as a function of time, how fluorescence goes up. And you see that it doesn't go up in a linear way. It goes up in these piecewise way. So if then they translate it, then they figured out how much fluorescence comes from one protein molecule, and they could just by, well, taking the derivative of this in a smart way, because you should never take a derivative of experimental data directly, they saw that the number of proteins actually increased in steps, okay? So most, so nothing happened, and then suddenly they saw many proteins from one mRNA. So this is what's called the burst. And this is how many um, proteins they sh sh saw being produced per burst. So how many proteins would get produced at one time? And you could see that it can go up to quite high numbers. So then they ask themselves, well, as this distribution that we're seeing, is it consistent with a model? And now we're getting into the regulation part. Is it consistent with a model where uh, I have uh, these, these molecules and then I, I'm sort of, con I mean, basically, is it consistent with a molecule where I frequently produce mRNA, but I produce few of them at one time, which is sort of what this cartoon here is showing. And in this case, you can do the calculation, you'll get a distribution like this. Or is it consistent with a molecule, with a model where I very infrequently produce molecules? So I produce one, you know, most of the time I don't actually produce any, but when I do, I produce a lot. And in this case, you get a distribution like this. And so this is consistent with this kind of distribution. And this is for, this is another type, well, this is the same thing. And this is in yeast. So this is E. coli in yeast. And so the main thing they're saying is that, in fact, what happens in cells is that we have this intermittent behavior, OK? So an intermittency it may be a word you know from other dynamical systems. Nothing happens, and then suddenly you get a lot of cells. Yes? Well, in the plateau? So what you're seeing is the signal, the reporter signal from a cell, right? From a cell where mRNA has been produced. So basically, it has been produced here. And you've produced on this, this, this is around 10. So you've produced 10 proteins from one mRNA. And now this mRNA or any other mRNA in the cell is not doing anything. It's not producing proteins. You don't, I mean, based on this experiment, you don't know whether it's, uh, you know, the mRNA is dying or not dying because there's probably a few in the cell, but they're not producing proteins. So what this is telling you is that there's not a continuous production of proteins, but it's like, it's like traffic lights, right? The cars stop and then they all go and then they all stop, right? Okay. Um, so what do I want? So this, this, this is what's, what are called, uh, the, these are called bursts, and they're called uh, tran translational bursts because they're from the mRNA, and you'll see a little bit about that in homework. And then there's another thing that can happen. Okay, so the other thing that can happen is we'll go into more details of the regulation. So this is a gene that can be expressed and this is our binding site now. Let's draw two versions of this. Now, we're going to say that we have 
a transcription factor. So the thing that regulates our gene, and we're going to call it C, okay? And I, sorry, it regulates our gene, but it, at the end, it produces proteins, which we'll still call G as before, okay? So this is a picture that having a concentration of this protein C will give us a certain number G. And the way it works is so, again, we have, we produce the proteins, right? So we produce our Gs and then they can die. Um, let me modify the diagram. But we're going to say that now we have two expression states. Uh, and now I have to make a decision, and I don't remember what I said in this example. Uh, it doesn't really, no, it does matter. Um, transcription factor, um, it goes plus if it unbinds. So I think I'm, I'm talking about a repressor. Yeah, it plus. Well, le, le, okay, le, let's talk about a, a repressor. Okay, so this is going to be a repressor. Uh, actually, no, let's talk about an activator because it's simple. Okay, so we're going to say that when the protein binds, it binds with some rate that depends on the concentration of this transcription factor, and then the gene finds itself in the activated state. So that means it's going to produce the genes, the, the proteins at an enhanced level. But this transcription factor can also unbind with a constant rate k minus. And if the gene finds itself in the unbound state without the activator bound, then it's going to produce still, it can still produce a bit of proteins, but it's going to do it at a, what's called the basal level, which is, you can think about this as being close to zero. Okay? In reality, biology is leaky. So it's very rare that there's really, really no production. But what this means is that there'll be like one protein produced per lifetime of the cell. Okay? A E. coli lives for about 30 hours, for example. Okay? So now we have a semi-continuous variable, G, but we also have a spin-like variable. Okay? which tells you whether the transcription factor is bound or whether it's unbound. So now if we want to calculate, describe the probability of the system, as I said, it's like a spin-like variable. Um, I need to, sorry, I need to do it like this. P zero. Okay. Okay. So this means this is the basal state and this is the activated state. Okay. I'm, I'm going to put these indices up here for the state. So this is the gene state index. But it doesn't matter. I could put them down here too. I, I, it's just notation. Okay. It's, don't, don't be confused by that. It's just, it does, there's no meaning to this. Okay, so activated means binding site is occupied. And basal means binding site is not occupied. Okay, and so now we're going to write down the master equation for this again. So now we have to write down a master equation for two states. This basal and this enhanced state. So let's start with the basal. So proteins are produced and they die just as before. So nothing changes here. I just need to put on the indices for the state.
okay? But the thing that changes is that now this state can change in two ways, either because the protein number changes or because the gene expression state changes. So you go into uh, being in the, this ba basal state with the binding site non-occupied if you unbind a transcription factor and you were initially in the bound state. And you go out of it by binding the transcription factor if you're, if you're in this state, okay? So this is and this is unbinding. Remember, we're assuming unbinding is constant. We're just assuming this is a number, this is some free energy difference. Okay, and then I have to do the same thing for the other one. So this is the same thing as before the break, and now I just added the, the binding state, so now the production rate is different, so this term has the same form, but with the rates being different. Nothing changes in degradation because given there's a protein, it's gonna die the same way. And now what changes here because unbinding now takes me out of this state and binding takes me into this state. So I have to change the sign. Okay, but this, these two equations are coupled. It's a set of equations. And I have now normalization is given by summing over the states and the number of proteins. And again, you can, you can solve this for a very, very long time. Um, I'm going to introduce, we're just going to do something very simple. Um, and I'm going to define first the probability of the binding site to be occupied. So I'm going to say I don't care about the DNA state. So I'm not going to care about the gene state, I'm just going to sum of it. And because of normalization, I have that the sum of these have to sum to one. So what I'm going to do now is that color, no, no colored chalk, okay. Um, I'm going to take this master equation, I mean both of them, so maybe I should do this here. And I'm going to sum it over G. Okay? So let me take the first one. So on the right hand side, if you sum this over G, by definition, you get n naught. So that's this. And then, if I sum these terms over G, you can now you can verify this, but you're going to get zero, okay? Because this is just the birth-death process. And uh, I mean, if you forget about these indices, uh, if you sum over G without anything. Uh, by definition, you have to get zero. That's the definition of a master equation, right? This master equation holds true for uh, if, if I didn't have the indices. And since none of the new terms interfere with it, if I just sum over G, it goes away. If you don't see it, 
just do, do it after the lecture. So we're just left with the binding and unbinding terms. But those are easy. I have k minus and I have pg1, I sum over g. That's the definition of n1. And I have plus kc, which also doesn't depend on g, of pg0, which is just n0. And um, let me eliminate, let me get rid of N0. N0, I know, is 1 minus N1. So that gives me K minus plus K plus of C times N1 minus, uh, sorry, plus, it's minus, yeah, this is a minus. Thank you. Uh, so, but this gives me a plus and this gives me a uh, minus K plus of C, right? Uh, N1. N1, very good. Uh, wait, I, I'm K minus K, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, so then if I wanna solve this in steady state, I solve for N1 and I get that N1 is K plus K minus plus K plus. Oops. Okay. Um, which is the answer that I wanted. Uh, now, it so happens a bit of biological detail now that K plus of C often has a form uh, like this. So it means it's a, it's a sigmoidal function. That means that the more transcription factor you have, the more binding you will get, and then there'll be some saturation level. So I can plug this in. And then I can divide uh, by K plus, and this thing is called a binding constant, an equilibrium constant. Okay, and this is the thing that is related to the free energy of binding. And so the, the larger this, so if you now, it would be good to have chalk, I'll draw it. So the production of the gene will take on this sigmoidal form, which is like a Fermi function, right? You can rewrite it in, in Fermi form too. And the point where it le where the so if this is maximum expression, this is half maximum expression. This is what the concentration here is what we call this equilibrium constant, and the slope of this curve is given by this coefficient h. So the steeper it is, the faster you go from between the two states. Excuse me? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, is this of the transcription factor? Of the transcription factor that binds. The transcription factor is the regulator of the process. It's the protein that binds and makes you switch between these two states. It's a constant, it's not a constant, it's a number that changes. It's not, it's not changed by any other parameter. So yes, it's a constant number in the model. It's not part of the master equation. But then you can change it and see how it influences the process. Um, okay. Um, so this is one way of deriving this, but uh, what I really want to, can I erase this part of the board now? I, 
I'd like to connect this with something that you're maybe more familiar with. So, has everybody done the absorption problem in statistical mechanics? You know, that you have a lattice site and you bind molecules? Yes? Okay, again, we're getting half-half. Who's done all the problems in Kubo? No? Okay, so we'll, we'll do that and you'll see how this is connected to the absorption problem. Okay, so we can think of a cell, so let's draw a cell. This is a physicist vision of a cell, okay? It's a lattice. It's a lattice where, with binding sites, and we have transcription factors, again, with concentration C, and these transcription factors can bind on any of these lattice sites, okay? But we're going to say there is one special binding site. And if I had a, I do have this brown color, okay? So let me do this one special binding site. Uh, and we're just going to, we're going to say it's special. So let me draw my cell again. Okay, of course it's an irreproducible cell, except for my special binding site. And so I can have two situations. So, uh, one, okay. So, right, so this is maybe getting a bit, yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of saying that like the transcription factors need to sort of uh, form diverse or yeah. polymers. Very good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Frank okay, partly I don't want to get into this because you'll you know, I think Matt will talk a lot about this. But yeah, what what this means is that I need some sort of cooperativity or nonlinearity, right? This basically introduces a nonlinearity in the problem unless C is equal one. So where does it come from? Uh, the simplest thing is that if H is equal to 2, that means I two proteins need to come together and form a dimer, and only as a dimer, this is going to look ugly, uh, can they bind and act as uh, transcription factors. And this is true for very many proteins. So, for example, the lag repressor we mentioned, that's a dimer that actually binds and then forms a loop and forms a tetramer. So we get a much higher effective Hill coefficient. Looping will also increase the Hill coefficient. But yeah, you need some, but it's important. That, so the important thing that I should have emphasized is that we usually have these steep uh, forms in, in, in the cell. So we have a lot of nonlinearity, okay? So, so far, uh, we've shown that there's stochasticity and we've shown there's nonlinearity in the system. So it's not, and we haven't really gotten very far, right? But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Production. Yeah. Oh. Right. But N1, uh, the production of proteins. So you can you can solve for the mean. You can solve for the G, which is sum over G, P, G of G, and you'll find it's equal to R1, N1, plus R0, N0. Okay? So if, I, if R0 is 0 or negligible, it essentially goes as R1, N1. Very good. So as I said, I'm sort of, you're, you're, you're doing a very good job of uh, keeping me in check and not having me cheat too much. So please continue because I, you know, I've decided I want to show you some things, but not the full picture, so, but I'm happy to fill in the gaps. Okay. So we're going to take a different view on this cell. This, this is a cell. Okay. As physicist vision of the cell. 
And so a transcription factor can bind in many places. So the important thing is, so I've been telling you that transcription factors go to the DNA and regulate it. But one question you can ask is, well, how does a transcription factor know to go to the right place? And it's a molecule and there's tons of DNA anywhere, everywhere else. So even if we say that a protein can only bind to DNA, which isn't true, how will it find the right bit of DNA for itself, right? You, you, you acknowledge this is a problem? Yes? Okay. Uh, so, in, actually the way it works is it, it doesn't work, okay? So, a protein is a protein and it tries to bind to different places and before it binds to the right place, it can bind to the wrong places. So there's many different places in the cell that it can bind to. And if it binds to, to the wrong place, we call it non-specific binding. And then there's the right place that it has to find in order to do its job of regulating something. Now, the way it's actually done is that it does have a preference for this, okay? An energetic preference. So it, the binding to the right side is much stronger than binding to all the many other sites. But there's many, many other sites. So there's an energy entropy balance, right? There's the entropic factor of binding to all the wrong sites. Okay, so this is the picture. So we can have two situations. One where the transcription factor bound, did bind to the right site. So this will call bound, well, bound to, to promoter. Now that, now that you're okay with the word promoter, and here we'll say not bound to promoter. So now I'm gonna look at this problem from a different perspective. I'm gonna say that in general, I have omega places where it can side. So omega binding sites by which I mean the non-specific ones, right? And I have one specific binding site. Um, and I have L transcription factor molecules. So that L divided by the volume of the cell is the concentration. Okay? And if I have this, pop, uh, this situation, then the energy of, it bind, of L molecules binding to the non-specific ones, I'm gonna call it LNS. And in this situation, I have L minus one bound non-specifically plus one bound specifically with an energy EB where EB is much more favorable than E. NS, okay? And I'm probably going to get, well, okay. So how many, how many ways of binding non-specifically do I have? If I, I've given you all the elements you need. Well, okay. It's a combinatoric factor, right? Yeah, everybody agrees that if I have omega binding sites and L transcription factors, I can distribute them in this number of ways. Okay, and in this case, I have one list to distribute. But, uh, I'm going to assume that omega is much larger than L, which makes sense. I have less transcription factors. Uh, so I, in that limit, I can approximate, okay, I can approximate omega over omega minus L as omega to the L. So again, Stirling expand, and you can check this. Uh, but this means that this becomes omega to dl over L factorial, and this becomes omega to dl over L minus one factorial. Or does it matter that I keep, yeah, L minus one. Okay. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the probability of being bound to this specific site like we do in thermodynamics, right? And I'm going to say that I need to weigh, calculate the weight of the bound state over all the weights in the problem. Okay. Just WB over Z. Right, everybody agrees? Basic thermodynamics, right? I want to calculate the probability of a given state. Assuming I'm in equilibrium, everything's in equilibrium, I just take the weight of the, that state by the total weight. This should give me N1 from what we had before. Okay, so let's do this. What is the weight of the bound state? Uh, well, it's this. So I have E to the minus beta EB. Uh, e to the minus beta L minus one non-specific. I have my omega L minus one over L minus one factorial. And then I have to add to that, so I can repeat this in the denominator. But I have to add to this the probability of now being in the non-bound state. So omega L, L bank, E to the E beta NS, L. Ah, yeah, I was supposed to not write too low. Sorry about that. But I, you know, you you can. I think you can fill this one in by yourself. Um, and now I'm going to divide everything by this factor. And I have to go somewhere. So I'll try to keep some of this. See what happens. Should be enough place. Okay. So then I get the p bound, which I said is n one to be. L over omega, e to the minus b. Delta E, Delta E, where Delta E is E bound minus E on specific. And I'm nearly there, so I just have to deal with this. Okay? And what I'm going to do is that I'm gonna, so as I said, concentration is just the number of transcription factors in the cell volume. So I'm gonna introduce a characteristic size uh, for how big a cell is. And that allows me to rewrite this in terms of the relative concentration uh, typical of the cell, okay? If you're worried by this, I'll spell it out. But if we say that L is like we said, and that the volume of the cell is the number of binding sites times the volume of a box around these binding sites, then C naught is one over the, is the number of molecules in the, in this box. And so then this becomes that. And so at the end of the day, we get that N bound 
equals C over C naught E. Well, okay, if I, I guess if I want to, um, let me rewrite it so that it looks exactly the same way. C over, well, okay, C over C naught E to the minus delta to E, C over C naught E to the minus delta E, and if I want it to look, this is the way that it makes sense, but if I want it to look the same, then I have C naught E to the beta delta E plus C, okay? So you see that we get back the same thing uh, as here with now relating this binding energy specifically to this ratio of binding and unbinding rates. Uh, and we don't, we don't have the Hill coefficient because we, we didn't assume it this time, so it's a, it's a special case. But the point of this is that this is a purely thermodynamic argument, right? It assumes that binding and unbinding is an equilibrium. And what this tells you is that this expression is true, is a thermodynamic expression too. It assumes equilibrium of binding, okay? If you don't have equilibrium of binding, and when can you not, what's the case when you don't have equilibrium of binding? When you have energy, right? When there's some additional force, source of energy, then, you, then this can change. And I guess the, yeah, the, the other important thing is that this thing you'll see, this has units of concentrations. I'll try to say that here, right? So maybe I should say this here. This has units of concentration. Okay. So that's the, that's the thermodynamic part. That's the binding part. I have 15 minutes. Um, I'll start by erasing. I can erase the cell, my cells, my square cells. Yes? You have a question? My Iranian isn't very good, so you have to ask in English. Go ahead. I mean, I, you know, I know everything I'm going to tell you for the next five hours, so. Okay. 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 Well, if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask later. As I said, it's a problem that probably most of you have seen on an exam and homework before. It's this absorption binding to a lattice problem. That's exactly what we did with just a slightly different interpretation. So, yeah. Uh, what you've done is uh, you explicitly use chemical potential, but you sort of yeah. captured it. When yes. So this is, this is related. And OK, I, I think I have a. Um, yeah, okay. The other, the, the, we can con continue rewriting this. We can also rewrite it as P bound C KD plus C. Uh, well, well, then it looks like that. And then KD specifically is e to the beta delta e plus mu zero. So this C naught is the chemical potential. That's another way to look at it. That's a good point. But as far as I remember, we can use it only if we assume that it's the dilute enough, right? So that is, so that is where we made the assumption that uh, 
Yeah, no, okay, so it's true. The combinatoric factors we got here are all, you know, are, well, no, the combinatoric factors would be true always, but um, yeah, the, I made the assumption that oh, the number of sites is larger than the number of ligands, but that is the most reasonable assumption in the world because you can bind anywhere in the cell, right? I mean, if you just think, even, even if you say, I can only bind to DNA, if you think about the length of DNA, if you wanted to fill every place you could bind on the DNA, you can do an estimate. You can take the size of DNA, the size of a protein, see how many proteins fit on the DNA, and ask how many proteins would I need in a cell to occupy every binding site. Okay, I think the protein volume would burst. You wouldn't have the space in the other direction to fit them in. And remember, the cell is a crowded environment. Like, the cell isn't, a, you know, a room filled with air. There's stuff everywhere. And this stuff is sticky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the equilibrium constant, so if you were a chemist, you'd have no, basically, okay, this is that the unbinding to binding rate or the binding to unbinding, then it depends whether you're a chemist or biologist, which way you define it. But this ratio gives you the equilibrium constant of binding, okay? And the equilibrium constant of binding is related to the free energy of binding, which is given by the difference between the specific and the non-specific binding. Yeah, no, it does, it does. It might be like, you know, sort of, it could be that, you know, it's favorable in the forward direction, the chance of binding specifically and not specifically the same, but detaching is higher in case of not specific. No, you, ha you, you have to have a, a, a you, you have to have a, you ha this has to be favorable because you have an entropic problem with everything else. And you can look, so people have looked at the distribution of energies of for specific, for one transcription factor, what's the distribution of energies to where it binds? And you see, you see a peak for specific binding, and then you see nothing, and then a huge tail of non-specific binding at higher energies. So you have, see this one low energy solution. I mean, you know, there is some this variance in it, but then nothing, you already and Okay, so this has been measured and it's definitely like that. And non-specific binding is a phenomenon and it does influence even regulation that if you have small concentrations, okay, this, this like opens up a whole can of worms about how do, as a transcription factor, how do I find my binding site? So there's an interesting question of, so what do proteins do? They diffuse. So there's the question of 3D versus 1D diffusion. You can do a calculation and maybe you'll do like a version of this later. Uh, that if, uh, if you were to just look for a binding site by 3D diffusion, it would take a very long time. So, and people have suggested, and then they went in and measured it, that what most transcription factors do, at least in bacteria, is they go to the DNA, they diffuse 1D along the DNA, they unbind, diffuse 3D, bind to a different part, 1D, and they do this mixture of 3D and 1D diffusion, okay? So, but this is it's a, it's a question. And then you think about diffusion in a crowded environment because that's what the cell is. So is it easier to diffuse in a crowded environment or not easy, easier? Um, this the, the answer actually is it depends. Um, but, you know, so, so here the answer is that this, uh, this, this 1D, 3D thing actually helps you a lot. It helps you as in orders of magnitude to find the binding site. But, the, you know, these are, these are all questions of sort of the, you know, from the life of a cell. Um, okay, quick story before we, we end. This is another experiment from, from Sunny Shi. And uh, it also goes into this uh, case of noise. And what he did is he did, well, Again, some poor postdoc of his called Yuichi Taniguchi. Uh, they looked at all the proteins that are expressed in E. coli. 
Okay, those are the pink ones. And they, they measured the distributions, they measured the mean number of proteins, and uh, you know, they made a histogram of the mean number of proteins. So in how many cells did they see this mean number of proteins? So these are all, and the blue ones are the essential. Essential ones means that if you get rid of this protein, that means you knock out the gene, E. coli no longer is able to produce this protein, it will die, it will surely die. That's what essential means, okay? And then they looked at the noise. So this is the variance by the mean squared as a function of the mean protein number uh, for, uh, for all of these proteins. And what they saw is that the proteins that are expressed in high numbers, they, they, they reach this plateau of noise. But the proteins that are expressed in small numbers, they have larger noise, and this noise goes as one over the mean. Okay, this is variance over mean squared. Remember we said that variance over mean goes as one. So variance over mean squared is one divided by the mean, and so that goes as one over n. And that's exactly what they see. So again, they see this small number noise in all of these different proteins that are expressed at uh, low levels. So then they went and looked at mRNA, because you can do experiments, these are called fish experiments. So now instead of looking at fluorescent proteins, you take your gene and you engineer it that you add some, uh, some new base pairs to the end of the gene. So when your gene is made into mRNA, you made the mRNA that was encoded in this gene, but you also make some additional mRNA. And this mRNA is like has these sticky loops that bind fluorescent, again, proteins, okay? So when the mRNA is expressed, it expresses itself, and then a bunch of loops that then bind fluorophores, things that will fluoresce. So when you see the mRNA being expressed, then you see it also bright up under your microscope. It's called FISH, fluorescent in C2 hybridization. And so FISH is a very powerful technique because it allows you to look at at mRNA directly. And so you see the mean protein number and the mean mRNA, uh, so, so they correlated the mean protein number with the mean uh, mRNA number. Uh, and they see there's a strong correlation, okay? And then some of them, uh, sorry, did all of this they actually got from a different technique, a high, more high throughput technique called RNA-seq, which uses sequencing, but they verified a few of those by, by fish. Anyway, they see a correlation between the number of mRNA and the number uh, of proteins. When they look at the mean number, the, the FANO factor, so this is the variance over the mean for mRNA, they see that it's usually larger than one, so that means we're seeing these bursts in mRNA expression. But okay, let's concentrate on this. They see it's at the same level. And they see uh, the, the thing is that when you do these experiments, you, in a way, you kill the cells. So you're doing something similar to measuring the steady state distribution. So the, what they're correlating here is from different cells, okay? Div not exactly the same cells, the same type of cell, but different cells. And then what they did is they went in and in each cell they built a construct that at the same time they were able to measure the number of proteins and the number of mRNA. And so this is what this is. Protein number on this axis, mRNA in this num on this axis from the same cell. And then you see there's absolutely no correlation. This is the correlation coefficient. Okay, so what's going on? Here they were seeing correlations between proteins and mRNA, which made sense because the, you know, the more mRNA you have, the more proteins you should have because that's where proteins come from. And here they look in the same cell and there's absolutely no correlation. So the answer is that it takes time. You have your mRNA and this mRNA produces proteins, but these proteins will not be seen at the same moment you see the mRNA from which they're produced. Right? It's as if somebody asked you, uh, took a picture of you and your parents aged 15 and asked, do you look similar? Right? You'd say, maybe, maybe you don't, but you know, let's say you do look like one of your parents. You'd say, yes, we look similar. And now they take a picture of your parents now aged 50 and you age now aged 25 or whatever and ask, do they look similar on these pictures? And 
probably most people would say no because you know your father has put on some weight or something right and you haven't so it's the same thing right here if you look at the exactly the same time you're seeing the 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 fa you know the future protein well the protein that was produced from the past the mRNA and the mRNA that will produce the future protein so no correlation so this is just to make the point that timing is also important and actually time delay coupled to this nonlinearity gives us also interesting effects in cells uh, but we won't talk about it so I think it's lunchtime with that and. Uh, We'll continue a bit about that and start on evolution after the break.